Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Matthew chapter 3 beginning at verse 13. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you come to me. Jesus replied, let it be so now, for it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water, and at that moment heaven opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and landing upon him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. This is the gospel of Christ. Let's just bow our heads to pray. May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and bring glory to you alone. Amen. Please be seated. Here we are in 2023. And here we are, remembering Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. In our first reading from Isaiah, which was hundreds of years before Jesus came to this earth, God lays out clearly what his plan is. He always warns us in advance about what is going to happen. You may think, well, why did Jesus have to be baptized when he had no sin? It's because it was foretold, he was fulfilling the word of his father, and he wanted to set an example for us to follow. Because being a disciple is not just going to college and doing an exam, it's becoming like the person you follow and emulating all the things in their life. The church, which is us, not the buildings, has been following Jesus for nearly 2,000 years. And Jesus tells us in Scripture... In several places, not least in the book of Revelation, that he's going to return. And he's going to return to Jerusalem, to the Mount of Olives. But he also makes clear that there will be signs that he's coming back. For those who have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that are open to hear it because as in Isaiah when Jesus coming and baptism and everything was predicted God always tells us in advance what is going to happen in Isaiah I am the Lord that's my name I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols Once we were a Christian nation. Now we have leaders who bow down to those very idols. It continues, see the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. So what are these signs that Jesus is returning. Jesus said there will be wars. There's always been wars. There'll be rumours of wars. There have always been rumours of wars. There'll be pestilence, pandemics. There's always been pestilence. Think of the Black Death. There will be natural disasters in many places. 
There'll be signs in the heavens. But it also goes and says, Jesus himself in Matthew says, when you see these things, don't worry about them. If your heart is for the Lord and you belong to him, look up because your Lord is near. But not taking scripture out of context, you need to test everything. And some of the other important things that need to happen to prepare for the Lord's return are, if Jesus is coming back to Jerusalem, to Israel, Israel needs to exist. And Jerusalem needs to be the capital. In 1948, Israel became a nation again. In 1967, Jerusalem was restored as the capital of Israel again. Two significant things happened which have never happened for 2,000 years. It also says that at some stage in the future, which hasn't quite happened yet, the Jews will rebuild their temple. Well, the problem is there's a dome of the rock and there's a mosque on the top of the temple mount. But anybody who's been to the old city of Jerusalem will know the Temple Institute exists. And in there, since the foundation of the State of Israel, they have been making all the instruments and all the tools and the gold menorah and everything necessary to rebuild the temple. Including the robes for the priests, the robes for the Levites, They've scoured the planet for DNA that proves you're of the line of Aaron to be a priest or Levi to be a Levite. And Levites lead the service of the temple and the music and the sacrifices. They've made the harps. They've made the silver trumpets which are needed. And they're putting together all the stones that are needed because the Bible says the stones have to be done off-site so that there's no noise of chiseling going on. So they can build it quickly. But then if you look at Leviticus, there are other things which need to be in place for the temple to be valid and consecrated to our Heavenly Father. And one of those is that you have to conduct a sacrifice from a particular animal, a cow. Actually, a red heifer. And they've been searching for decades for red heifers that are perfect and of a certain age. And five have been found and are now in Jerusalem. Those who have eyes to see, all these things coming together, But it also says in scripture that as we come closer to the return of the Lord, other things will happen. There will be the great falling away of the church. Well, we know that's happening, particularly in the West. In other persecuted areas, the church is growing like topsy, but in the West... It's falling off the cliff. It also says there will be those who will follow preachers who will tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear. Well, we know that happens too. It also makes clear that there will be some terrible things taught 
in the end times. The Bible calls it teaching theology of demons. And only in the last month we have heard blasphemous things taught in the name of Christ and not one leader of the Church of England has spoken up against it. First of all, there was the sermon in Cambridge given by a research student that was funded and supported and overseen by the Archbishop of Canterbury and his pre predecessor who was doing a dissertation on a painting from the Middle Ages and it's Jesus being taken down off the cross and he says that basically because of the wound in the side of his uh, body that was a vagina and that the blood pouring down on his genitals made him transgender. And only a few days ago, a week ago or so, a clergyman married with two kids in the Liverpool diocese, I think it was, said he had an epiphany and God told him to come out as non-binary. Has he not read the book of Genesis that God created a man and woman? He didn't create something that's not quite either in the middle. Thankfully in Cambridge some of the congregation shouted blasphemy because it is blasphemy. But where is the truth? Where is it being preached? You know, the Archbishop of Canterbury has had two major opportunities with his New Year speech and also in the House of Lords, and he spoke about politics. Recently, I wrote to our bishop outlining my position is based on what it says in the Bible. In relation to the discussions that are going on about same-sex marriage, transgenderism, the moral decline of our, nature, our whole country. And I called upon him to uphold biblical understanding. And I clarified that when I was ordained, I had to vow, they don't vow anymore. That's another thing I, which is... I had to vow that I would uphold the historic formulas of the Church of England as revealed in Scripture, the 39 Articles, and the Book of Common Prayer, and the Ordinal, which is the ordination service, which upholds a biblical conservative view from a Protestant perspective. Nowadays, when people get ordained, they only have to assent. And all that means is, well, I recognise they're there. And that's why it was quite funny when David Picken, the Archdeacon, licensed me as the uh, vicar and incumbent of the Tuxford Benefice, when it came to my dib-dib-dib bit, when I had to swear allegiance to the Bishop of the Queen and all the rest of it, I said, I vow and assent, and he burst into hysterics. <laughs> but it's true. And I clear, clearly said to the bishop that I made that vow, I meant it then, and I mean it now, and have not changed, and will not change. And as I said also in this letter, you may wonder why I'm so 
strong on this point. Apart from it being God's word, and we're just human little specks on a speck in the multiple universes they've discovered. Only God can change his word, and he won't. But also when I was ordained, uh, I was ordained uh, as Philip. That's my baptism name. It was Ramon Philip Price. And somebody gave me a piece of paper saying, God wants you to be called Gregory. It wasn't until several years later that I actually, by deed poll, changed my name to Gregory and then discovered that Gregory means watchman. So the Lord was saying he was giving me a task. I was also given a scripture of Ezekiel 33. And Ezekiel 33, and I knew it was for me, says, I have called you to be a watchman. And if you see danger, and you do not warn the people, and they get hurt or die, their blood is on your hands. But if you give the warning and they take no notice, it's on their own heads. But where is that calling and commitment today to stand up for the truth? I can't remember which country it is now, but somebody has been put in jail for three years for saying that a man can't have a baby. It's crazy. And it's because we've turned our back on God. And I also know scripture says that those who lead are doubly judged. For what they did, for what they didn't do, for what they said or what they didn't say. And I tell you one thing. I'm not going to stop saying the truth. And it's not my opinion. It's what it says in the Bible. Because scripture is very clear that if you hear anything from anybody who's a leader, go to the Bible and check it. And if it's wrong, that person is a false teacher and should be cast out of the church. So it's not my opinion, it's what it says in God's word that matters. And as in our second reading it says, I now realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. And that's why that's linked to John the Baptist coming out of the wilderness and proclaiming repent for the kingdom of God is near. It says demonstrate fruit in line with repentance. And that's having a right heart with God. He knows what we're like. He knows that we're sinful. He knows we prefer a comfortable life rather than challenges and difficulties and refining. But he loves us. And even though you might not understand this, the reason why I'm telling you all this is because I love you. And I want you to know the truth because the truth will set you free. And because no one else, or very few, or not enough, are speaking out. And there are going to be changes that I think are coming along the line. The living in love and faith dialogue, which has been going on between bishops and some parishes about sexuality. The bishops are meeting in a couple of weeks. They've already met once. None of them are speaking about what they discussed. 
It will be put to synod in February. And then in July, the church will vote about which way they're going to go on same-sex marriage and all the rest of it. So now the bishop knows where I stand. <laughs> it was very interesting that uh, less than a week later, I got an email saying, oh, we're just reminding you that you're due for an appraisal. <laughs> so, well, there we go. So. so to him be the glory. And the other thing is, which is really good, now that I've told you, you can't say you don't know. Amen.